Uh, it was pointed out to me, I didn't introduce myself when I came up the first time. Um, and, and that's because I think I, I know most of you, and most of you know me. Uh, I am either Gene Spafford or a m modestly well-working AI simulation thereof. Uh, and um, I, I'm sort of the corporate memory of this organization now in, in some regards. And, and that's uh, where I'll, I'll reach for uh, introducing our first keynote. Um, when we were uh, sort of planning these events on a yearly basis, to both expose our students and faculty to research going on outside uh, and also to have people outside of Purdue find out more about what we were doing here at the university. Uh, we structured the symposia around the idea of some selected keynotes where we'd reach out to distinguished individuals uh, representing government, uh, representing industry, and representing the practice. And so each year for the past N years for N, a small number, uh, we have sent out these invitations and we have been very fortunate uh, to have people come to represent those various sectors. Uh, for the industry side, we've managed to attract CEOs and CTOs of international organizations, um, individuals who've gone from startups to multi-million uh, dollar uh, companies, and they've been very happy to share their expertise with us. Uh, on the government side, we have been able to attract um, presidential advisors, uh, cabinet secretaries and uh, deputy secretaries, the executive assistant director of the FBI, uh, and on one occasion, the recently retired director of national intelligence. So we've had uh, some wonderful speakers in here and we're continuing that tradition today. Uh, our first keynote representing the government sector uh, is uh, Brigadier General Retired uh, Greg Tuhill. Uh, Greg started off as an engineering major at Penn State, and uh, he has a, an interesting story. I'm not going to relate all of it here, but uh, as a result of a uh, uh, missile launch gone awry, he decided it might be safer to move to a different field and uh, ended up graduating with a degree in political science. Uh, along the way in his military career, he picked up two master's degrees in systems management uh, and in strategy. Uh, uh, in the Air Force, he served as director of uh, command control communications and cyber for transportation command, was the deputy assistant director uh, for, for cyber at DHS, and um, most recently um, was the first federal CISO, the Chief Information Security Officer. Uh, we're especially pleased to have him here because at our first symposium, we had the first ever CISO. Steve Katz, who was the CISO for uh, Citibank, uh, had, was the first person to occupy that title. Greg is the first person to have that role in the federal government. We're thrilled to have him here. Please join me in welcoming General Greg Tuhill. Thanks, Beth. Good to see you. Thank you. Can you hear me with this mic? Is it turned on? All right, thumbs up in the back. I'm going to put the handheld down. Yeah, to complete the story, I was a, like a third lieutenant intern at the Rocket Propulsion Lab at Edwards Air Force Base between my junior and senior year. I saw an O-ring burn through on the uh, solid rocket fuel booster. And uh, frankly, I didn't like the people I was going to be working with. And I was going to go there as a second lieutenant. And the only way I could escape that assignment was to not take a bachelor's of science. And with the support of my father and the colonel, I flip-flopped my major and my minor. And uh, the Air Force didn't know what to do with me, so they put me in this new field called computers and uh, electronics. And uh, the rest is history. I never went back. I'm eight credits short of chemical engineering, and I'm not going back. <laughs> And it's funny, too, because my father's got a PhD in engineering. He really, really wanted me to go there. But uh, no, I made the right choice. I think it was a divine inspiration. Today, I'd like, uh, we've got a choice. And I'd like to do a quick poll. Uh, as a former government official, I have been trained to stand behind the podium and read to you a speech. How many want that kind of presentation today? As opposed to, let's have a conversation with lots of pictures. Okay, let's go for the first one. Stodgy speech, 
Anybody? Okay, we've got one brave person who has, he's, he's juiced up on caffeine. He's ready. <laughs> How many folks want to have a conversation about cyber? Okay, great. All right, so today what I'd like to do is this, I'd like to share some of my life lessons on cybersecurity. And the first thing is cyber is not a technology issue. Technology is the most important part of it, in my, my view, as a technologist. But it's not the only part. At its heart, cybersecurity is a risk management issue. It's all about risk. And, you know, why should you care about cybersecurity? Well, I've been asked that question throughout my professional career in a lot of different fora. And, you know, I talk about it as a risk management issue, and it starts getting the attention of directors of companies, you know, cabinet officials. Um, it gets the attention of the C-suite as well. And I think it's really important that all of us be prepared to make the business case for what we're doing in cybersecurity. Because the decision makers who allocate resources are critically important in making sure that you're able to follow through. Because if it ain't funded, it ain't. So, anybody know who this, this picture represents? This is Sun Tzu. Okay, Sun Tzu, and uh, as a War College graduate, I'm obliged in every speech to refer to Sun Tzu and quote a dead German. So, uh, <laughs> Sun Tzu said, if you know your enemy and you know yourself, in a thousand battles you shall not be vanquished. Today, what I'd like to do is walk through some of the lessons learned as to knowing yourself as well as knowing your enemy, and give you some tips that maybe you, will be helpful for you as you're putting together a cybersecurity program to better manage your risk. And as you go into that, why should you really be paying attention to Sun Tzu? Well, the first thing is, is information is an asset. People want to get your assets, so you've got to cover your asset. <laughs> you need to protect your information because information is at the center of every one of your missions, your operations. It's your intellectual property. It's your brand and reputation. It's the privacy of yourself and your clients, your integrity, your trust levels, safety, competitive advantage. All of, the, all of the above are now wrapped into your cybersecurity posture. You can't operate a business, you can't operate a government, you can't operate a household without having a solid cybersecurity program in place. Think about that. Home, office, and everywhere in between. And now, with such legislation as Sarbanes-Oxley and some of the new legislation that's come out for corporate responsibility, due care and due diligence is also part of the cybersecurity lexicon. If you are not practicing best practices in managing your information, you expose yourself as a business to calls that you are not practicing due care and due diligence, which now, under the legal construct, carries with it a heavy burden for the officers and the directors of companies. As you go in and you talk to the, the head shed, make sure that you do a little bit of homework on what constitutes due care and due diligence, and put your language in their language, okay? Don't get hung up on the technical terms, because it'll just cause the eyes to roll in the back of their heads. They won't really care when you get into your inner geek. What they do care about is when their bacon is on the line. Make the business case. Now, here's a interesting uh, little slide. Frankly, I've gone through in, in my military career and my government uh, career and working with the private sector, I see a lot of folks put out verbose uh, tomes uh, spelling out strategies. Strategy for this or strategy for that. I'll tell you that anybody who puts out a lengthy strategy book is fooling themselves because very few people have the time or patience to read them. What was our strategy in World War II? Hold in the Pacific, win in Europe, go back and defeat the Japanese in uh, the Pacific. That was our grand strategy. 
hold, win, win. Every soldier, sailor, airman, and marine knew that strategy. Everybody at home knew that strategy. Everybody was coming together. What's our cybersecurity strategy for your different organizations that you work with? Anybody? Bueller? Bueller? Anybody? Well, you know, when I came in as the federal uh, uh, CISO, our strategy was codified in a lengthy tome that very few folks outside of academia and policy uh, wonks actually read. And it was increasingly difficult to articulate in different uh, circles within the federal government. So I came out and I put together a strategy, five sentences. Because if the troops can't articulate the strategy, it doesn't get done. First part of that strategy, harden the workforce. Everybody's on the cyber front lines, right? Home, office, everybody needs to be cyber aware. You don't need to be a cyber expert and you know, all the secret cyber ninja stuff. You don't have to be a CISSP or a CISM to be cyber aware. You know, for crying out loud, mom, don't click that link. <laughs> Two, you have to treat information as an asset, right? Information is an asset. Three, you've got to do the right things the right way and arguably at the right time. Four, continuously innovate and invest wisely. You know, we've got to introduce into the federal government this really groundbreaking concept called depreciation and recapitalization of IT assets. And then the fifth one is we've got to make informed cyber risk decisions at the right level. Too often, folks were, senior leaders were kicking decisions to the kids in the server room. And you know what? It wasn't working. So from a strategy standpoint, five sentences makes sense. You know, we fleshed it out too because the strategy that doesn't get executed is just shelfware. So we actually put a, uh, goals that were feasible, acceptable, suitable, and affordable along with them. Unfortunately, often we have, when the new teams come in, they throw out the old strategies and they got to go create their new ones. Let's see how the new strategy compares to that strategy as it's coming forward. But in the past, the government went out and bought everything. You know, and frankly, one of the things that uh, as I came out of the military and into DHS as the Deputy Assistant Secretary, we didn't know all the stuff we had. You know, so one of the things we did is, is under the Continuous Diagnostics and Mitigation Program, which is a $6 billion uh, program, one of the first things we did is, is we put together a strategic construct to a, know what you have, you know, what's on your network, who's on your network, and what's going on in your network. Three strategic lines of effort. Knowing what's on your network turned out, you know, we knew that it was a mess. Dog's breakfast. You never knew what you are going to find. And uh, we found that uh, just in the first pass and putting discovery tools on government networks, we found $77 million worth of additional equipment that the departments and agencies didn't even know they had. And I think that number is going to go way, way up. Strategy matters, but it's got to be clear and concise. As you're putting together the strategies for your organization, put it in a language that everyone understands. Bounce it off of your mom. If your mom understands your strategy, you're making a good start. All right, let's see if I can get this to move. All right, anybody know this group here? These are the flying Wolendas. Do you, do you think that every single one of them knows where their risks are? I would submit the answer is yes. We all need to make sure that we understand our risk. And that gets in with the hardening the workforce standpoint. This is not just an IT issue when we talk about cybersecurity. It is a business issue. Everybody has a stake in it. So you need to culturally address cybersecurity from the top of the organization all the way down. And in the federal government, one of the things that really irked my, uh, well, let's just say, didn't make me happy was we did just one and done training. And, you know, the annual watch a, a, a stupid video and then take a, you know, sometimes you took a test, sometimes you didn't. One and done training doesn't work, folks. And uh, one of the things that we tried putting into the uh, budget that just came out 
was some additional training and exercises. Because if you don't exercise, you don't uh, succeed. Uh, how many folks know who Newt Rockne was? Famous Indiana coach, right? He said practice makes perfect, right? How about Vince Lombardi? What did he say? He said Rockne was wrong. Vince Lombardi said perfect practice makes perfect. And whose name's on the trophy now? As you're going through and building your program, make sure that you focus on the culture and make sure that everyone knows what the risks are. Because all it takes is one stupid person. Oh, I'm sorry, I went through government counseling. Uh, one ill-informed and uh, unmotivated person to, you know, to trip on the wire and take everybody down. Now, Sun Tzu would say it's critically important to know your enemy. Who's your enemy? Okay, you know, training camp's going to be happening, and uh, you know, I think Andrew Luck is probably looking at this guy and saying, "Hmm, this is somebody who's on my watch list." Okay, everybody knows who Tom Brady is, right? Yeah, I'm from Pittsburgh. We know who he is. What do you need to know about your enemy? Well, first of all, you need to identify who they are. And you need to understand what their motivations are and why they may act against you. And what kind of information would they be seeking that you possess? Um, you need to know what their objectives are and their capabilities. You know, there's some people who are still wannabes. Do you give them as much attention as those who have more capabilities? This is audience participation. This is where you give the resounding no. Okay? You got to know your enemies. You also need to understand their patterns of behavior, their attack vectors, their typical plans, and the like. And through information sharing, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, you certainly can get that information. Even when some folks say, oh, well, that's classified. I can't tell you. Yeah, there's ways to get that information. And that's one of the things that uh, I think the government does a crummy job on is the intelligence communities will classify everything top secret, sensitive compartmented information as a default. One of the things I tried doing is just turning the tables and say everything's unclassified because you're pulling it off the internet. You got to prove why it has to be secret, uh, you know, top secret, et cetera. But know who your enemies are. Invest in business intelligence. Invest in information sharing. Because if you don't know who your enemies are, as Sun Tzu would say, you will be vanquished. Now, there's a lot of threats in your neighborhood, okay? So here are some of the typical types of enemies that I see out there. And when I retired from the Air Force, a friend of mine gave me a laser pointer that looks like a bullet. It's great going through TSA with this. Okay, so I would submit that the first enemy that you've got to plan for are vandals, okay? Vandals are folks that are going to come by and they're, they've got an agenda. They're going to come, uh, for example, to your website. And a friend of mine, Gary Harbison, is the uh, CISO at Monsanto. Every time Monsanto comes out with a new formulation of Roundup, guess what happens? They know that they're going to have some folks, often it's going to be anonymous, they're going to come in and they're going to try to deface their website, impugning their brand and their reputation. Monsanto plans for that and can do a wipe and reload in about 20 seconds or less. And they have competitions to see who can detect and uh, do the wipe and reload. And, you know, it, they reward those who are active on their team. But they know that, that threat is out there. Who are the vandals in your neighborhood? What about burglars? Burglars, they're the financially motivated. They're crooks. And you don't have to have a name that ends in Av or Ski to be a burglar. You know, my friends in the FBI and the Secret Service, they're tracking burglars, uh, you know, criminals that are financially motivated around the world, here in the United States as well as overseas. You know, frankly, the ones overseas uh, generally get a little bit more safe haven in some places than, than they get here in the United States. And computer crime in the United States is actually pretty sophisticated, but it's not as pernicious and prevalent as what we're seeing from overseas sources. 
And for those folks who think that the bad guys overseas get away, look up on, uh, on your favorite browser sometime later tonight, Victor Drinkman. Victor Drinkman ripped off a couple, uh, you know, dozens of uh, millions of dollars from some financial institutions from his safe haven in uh, Eastern Europe. But Victor and his young bride decided that they wanted to take a newlywed trip to Amsterdam, home of some of the greatest artworks in the world and uh, some pretty liberal uh, laws regarding narcotics and uh, other things. And they, they were going to take a great vacation. So Victor and his new wife, they get to Amsterdam, they pull out the cell phone, and they take a selfie and post it on their Facebook. And, and what did uh, Victor fail to do? He forgot to put off geotagging. He forgot that the Secret Service, which does financial crime, is like monitoring you know, Facebook uh, and, and looking for them. All it took was that post, uh, uh, an alert Secret Service agent, a uh, phone call to the the authorities there in Amsterdam, and Victor won an all-expense-paid trip to New Jersey. <laughs> you know, the United States government is serious about this and will track down uh, these folks, even if it takes three years like it did Victor Drinken or more. But burglars are out there, and you've got to plan for them. And they, they're financially motivated, and there's big money in this game now. How about, you know, the, the, uh, the spies that are out there? Do you think that the spies are the most prevalent? I think there's two types of spies. There's the nation state spies, but then there's also in, uh, those that are seeking intellectual property theft. And they're pretty prevalent. And uh, you know, just ask some folks from the CIA or the NSA over the last couple of weeks about spies. What about your business? What kind of intellectual property do you have and who has access to it? What data loss prevention systems do you have in place? I would submit that if you take a look at the Edward Snowden and the Bradley Manning cases, both of them could have been thwarted by more effective frontline supervision. Not necessarily a techno technology of a DLP per, uh, you know, solution, but frontline supervision. What are you doing to train your frontline supervisors to thwart insider threats? And, Spying. Something to think about, something to implement. How about muggers? Do you think that there's internet muggers out there? I certainly submit that there are. And it goes beyond just the high school bullying that's out there. Do you think that um, the folks at Sony Motion Pictures felt that they got mugged by North Korea? Yeah, I, I'll definitely tell you that they thought they got mugged. In some regards, Though I, I got to tell you, and this is not a, uh, an official stance of the United States government or endorsed by the commissioner of Major League Baseball. But I, frankly, I think the North Koreans did Sony a favor uh, because I don't think many people were going to go watch that movie, you know. <laughs> but once they hacked in, boy, we were doing in the NCIC, the National Cybersecurity and Communications Integration uh, Center, where I served as the director. You know, we had the U.S. cert, the Industrial Control System cert, and a, a host of alphabet soup, uh, pretty important entities in the NCIC. We did the double feature of Team America followed by the interview just because we're Americans, right? But there's muggers out there. You've got to plan for that. Those are part of your enemies that you've got to understand that are out there. I think saboteurs, and you guys recognize Timmy, Timothy Oliphant from the arguably the, one of the worst Die Hard movies ever. <laughs> Who are the saboteurs? You know, saboteurs are pretty pernicious, but they're very difficult to detect. Um, you never want to have a single point of failure when you're designing or architecting your networks or your information stores. But you have to understand that you've got to build in, according to the cybersecurity framework, the resiliency to take a punch and keep on going. You have to be able to survive a saboteur. And there will be a saboteur at some point out there. And that saboteur could be deliberate or the greatest threat that's out there, the careless, negligent, or indifferent. Now, that's, uh, of course, Jim Carrey and uh, his sidekick, 
uh, Jeff Daniels from Dumb and Dumber. Um, I would submit that over 85% of the incidents that uh, my teams in the US CERT and the Industrial Control System CERT responded to were the result of careless, negligent, or indifferent people. I'll repeat that. 85% the result of careless, negligent, or indifferent people. Now, I used to append stupid, but those years of government training and counseling <laughs> came into play, and I was told not to mention stupid again. Uh, but wait a minute, I'm no longer in the government. Yeah, plan for stupid, all right? <laughs> That's going to be your number one risk factor, to be perfectly honest. Statistically speaking, careless, negligent, and indifferent people offer a great threat risk exposure. You need to plan for it. And how do you mitigate some of that? Through education and training and exercising. Practice makes perfect, but perfect practice makes perfect. Okay, let's see if I can get this to advance. I've got to step back. Here we go. Here's some other uh, threats that are out there. Uh, I'm not going to delve into these, uh, but physical threats uh, remain an issue that we all have to plan against. Geography matters. You know, for example, I consulted with a company that uh, is in the uh, greater Phoenix area. And one of the, th the reasons they picked uh, that place for their data storage location is seismically, it's not very active there. If you go to Phoenix, good luck getting any seismic activity. The only seismic activity you're going to get there is sonic booms from Luke Air Force Base. And they have water. Uh, you know, this right here, I used to be commander of Keesler Air Force Base. That's the comm center at Keesler Air Force Base. I was sent in as a commander after Hurricane Katrina, and they were 10 miles east of Ground Zero. Um, and my job was to not only continue to train and educate airmen, but to rebuild the base. It's amazing what a billion dollars will do, folks. Um, you know, if you're living on the Gulf Coast, you've got to plan for hurricanes. If you're living here in the Midwest, tornadoes. There's California. You know, what, guess what California's thinking about? Earthquakes. Uh, there's uh, Fukushima. If you're living near a nuclear uh, reactor, don't necessarily feel comfortable if it's on a seismic location on the coast where there could be a tsunami. Who would know, right? Don't forget, too, about your paper records. Cybersecurity isn't just the ones and zeros. It's all about the information. Down in the lower corner, corner and I don't think everybody can see this, is a, the residual detritus from the devastating fire at the National Archive in Seattle, or pardon me, in St. Louis. Um, a lot of World War II veterans, all of their records were in St. Louis in hard copy format. There was no backup. Uh, for that information. And a fire went through and destroyed all the paper records. Uh, my Uncle Dick is going to be interred in uh, Arlington on May 5th. Uh, he died. He was a World War II fighter pilot. It took us quite a while to get his records together so that we could, in fact, prove that he was a World War II veteran. You got to figure your paper records as well as part of your, your backup strategy. And then, of course, you know, for those of us who have spent some time in the great Pacific Northwest, you know there's Mount St. Helens. Uh, are you ready for when the next big volcanic eruption occurs? Plan for all of your threats as if they were an enemy. I think it's important, too, that you uh, participate in what I call the Cyber Neighborhood Watch. I, uh, uh, I coined this phrase when I was at DHS because I think it's really important that we all think of ourselves like a neighborhood watch when it comes to cyber. If you don't know what's going on in your neighborhood, you can, you're going to be victimized. And one of the things that I did while I was at uh, Homeland Security when it came to information sharing is I, I tried building that culture with my folks so that we could, in fact, share information in a manner that people would understand, but also protect the identities of the victims. So if a guy like Greg comes into Gary's neighborhood, and I come in at 2 o'clock every afternoon. It's a gated community, too, by the way. Let's say it's all of our neighborhood, and there's the gate. Greg comes into the neighborhood. He's about six feet tall. He's driving a 1998 green Toyota Sienna van with a dent in the right rear quarter panel. Errant golf ball, wasn't mine. Um, 
I break into Gary's house. And I'm there between, you know, 1 2 o'clock every day when most folks are out at work or spouses are off getting kids from school and the like. I break into your house, Gary, and you had some really cool electronics. Thanks so much. Your silver collection, I know it's been in the family for years. My family will enjoy it for years as well. And that cute dog you had, thank you so much. My daughter will really like that dog. Does everybody in the neighborhood need to know it was Gary's house that got broken into? This audience participation? No. Do you need to know as much as you can about Greg, the assailant? His tactics, techniques, and procedures, what he looks like, what he's driving, how he's going in, that he defeated the lock on Gary's front door, and oh, by the way, you want to check and see if you got the same lock? Maybe that lock was manufactured in Redmond, Washington. You want to see if you've got the same kind of lock. I think it's important that you join information sharing mechanisms and subscribe to different products that are out there. One is through the NKIC. You can go to uh, www.uscert.gov and uh, subscribe for information sharing from there. You can go to cert.org out of Carnegie Mellon. Center for Internet Security uh, up in Albany, New York. The ISACs that are out there, the Information uh, Sharing and Analysis Centers. You can go to join InfraGuard, the FBI partnership program. You can come uh, and uh, participate with different uh, information sharing and analysis organizations. And you can continue to support Sirius because Sirius is a fabulous, well-renowned, cross-country information sharing mechanism that's out there. Doesn't matter how many you join, as long as you share and you benefit from the information sharing. It's important, too, to know yourself. Can you guys see what's behind these divers? For those who can't, we've got two divers there with a great white right behind them. And the, uh, the, the phrase there says situational awareness. Yeah, it's important. Wouldn't you want to know if there's a great white behind you? Yeah, I think so. I think it's critically important that you know yourself and don't take a look just at the technology. Understand the business and the culture of the organization that you're in. Understand your information, the architecture upon which it's stored, the hardware and the software tools that are used to uh, store, maintain, retrieve, archive, etc. You have to understand the workforce and their talents and their weaknesses. And here's some foot stomping stuff. This is where you take notes. Um, better understand your suppliers and your third party uh, uh, chains and your, you also need to understand the strengths and weaknesses of your third party vendors. And a lot of folks leave that by the wayside with really bad results. OPM, the Office of Personnel Management, anybody hear them? <laughs> OPM got breached because a third party vendor that was doing background investigations private company, they, um, they had an investigator who, um, in short, the evidence points towards the uh, investigator took his laptop, plugged into a, um, a dirty network, was compromised, and then the adversary set used the username and password credentials of that background investigator to come in through the back door to OPM. And the, invest, or, you know, the investigation indicates that the adversary understood the business process that was being followed and came looking, feeling, and acting like a legitimate user. Now, frankly, I, my view is that they probably could have and should have detected the bulk transfers a lot better. But nonetheless, you know, uh, frankly, Username and password was state-of-the-art in the 80s. Why are we still using it now? And that's something you can talk about later today. All right. Knowing yourself really starts with your information. Napoleon said, war is 90% information. I'm checking another box in my Air War College uh, requirement. I'm quoting a dead general. But how much is your information valued? Where is your information? Who has access to it? Do you know yourself? Most folks do not. And most folks are hoarders. 
They're going to be on the Discovery Channel where folks are going to buy stuff. They'll open up the information vaults and find all sorts of stuff that they didn't know they have. We see it all the time, both in the public and private sector. Take a look at your own Gmail account. How many folks don't delete things from their, their Gmail or their Yahoo, Hotmail, Outlook 365, you know, because they don't have to? Storage is cheap, right? So why delete? How many of you are guilty? How many of you are not honest? <laughs> OK. All right, another thing, too, as you're taking a look at knowing yourself, beware the good idea fairies. There, there are so many folks who have declared themselves cybersecurity experts who wouldn't be able to pour something out of a boot if the instructions were written on the heel. I was at a forum in Fairfax County, Virginia uh, at the beginning of the month, and um, folks were looking, it was an entrepreneurship summit where they were trying to bring folks in to teach them how to create their own business. And this woman came in um, and uh, she said she was starting up a cybersecurity business. And uh, she arrived fashionably late, which was really uh, appreciated by most of the folks in the room. But when they asked her why, you know, what credentials she brought to the table, she said, well, I see it as a growing field. I'm an attorney, and I see some opportunity there. Um, you know, that's kind of cool if you are a lawyer and you specialize in certain stuff. But you know what? When it comes to what we do for a living, um, make sure that you, are, um, you dig deeper when you've got these folks that are claiming themselves to be experts. I frankly was raised by parents who uh, told me, anybody who declares himself an expert isn't. But there are a lot of good idea fairies who are going to come around. They're going to try to sell you the latest tool or the, the latest hardware uh, solution. Be a demanding customer. And if anybody says they got a silver bullet to solve this problem, I contend that they're wrong. There's a lot of different, you're going to have to spend a lot of bullets in order to uh, better manage your risk. Now, I did mention as part of the strategy that continuously innovating and investing wisely is critically important. That was part of our strategy. And age does matter in our business. Now, I introduced a concept uh, that I called Two Hills Law uh, in talking with the, uh, the folks in the uh, senior levels of government. We, I would go in every month and I would brief the uh, President's Management Council, which is one layer down below the cabinet. It's basically the deputy secretaries. And we were trying to get uh, a $3 billion IT uh, working capital fund to replace a lot of old computers. I had to put it in terms that they could understand. So I created, well, even when I was in the military, I created this called Two Hills Law. So let me explain what Two Hills Law is, because you might want to use it someday. How many folks have heard one human year equals seven dog years? Fine, it's Indiana. I would have thought there'd be a whole lot more on that one. Yeah. I'm from Pittsburgh. That's a Midwest city. It's west of the Alleghenies. All right, so one human year equals seven dog years. How about anybody here of Microsoft? Never, right? Well, Microsoft and great American companies like it typically come out every three years with a generational leap forward, right? And then Health and Human Services Department says the average lifespan in the United States is 78.7 years. I'm going to round that to 75 because it makes the math easier. 75 divided by 3 equals what? 25. So therefore, under Two Hills Law, one human year equals 25 computer years. I'll let that sink in for a moment. One human year equals 25 computer years. So I would contend that if you do the math, you've got a four-year-old computer. It's about 100 years old. Ladies and gentlemen, in the federal government, we had several computers that were well over thousands of years old. <laughs> I found one computer in uh, uh, a certain space agency that was commissioned in 1964. <laughs> and of course, somebody decided, hey, this needs to be internet facing, so we're going to bolt something on. <laughs> So I would go into board meetings, the President's Management Council, and I'd say, look, here's a right flyer circa 1903. We're putting right flyers.
years up against MIGs and the new Chinese J, J20, which looks surprisingly a lot like a, some of our aircraft. <laughs> How about your infrastructure? If you're making the business case for security, you need to be current. And it's not just current with your equipment, it's current with your software, it's current with your people. And training your technicians never stops. You have to factor that into your business cases. You have to know yourself. Now, a lot of folks are flying into the clouds right now. And I'll tell you, I, uh, I've actually lost some friends who flew into clouds and only to find there was a mountain on the other side, literally. By the way, that's me. Uh, uh, and when I go and I talk with folks about cloud computing, I'm a big fan. I really am a big fan. But you have to go in with your eyes wide open and you need to know what's on the other side. We had a lot of uh, government agencies, and I saw this in the private sector as well, who ran into contracts, uh, cloud computing contracts, because everybody said, hey, it's the, the latest and greatest, newest, coolest thing. But they didn't put portability into their contracts. So when the contract came up, when they go for a rebid, they could get a better deal somewhere else. But what about taking that information and porting it over? Uh-oh. So here's a couple of lessons learned. As you're going to do a cloud computing contract, security needs to be part of the requirement set. Portability needs to be part of your requirement. You need to retain the ability to do independent third-party auditing to make sure they, in fact, are meeting your requirements, particularly when it comes to security. Do not, uh, do not relinquish your ability to conduct pen testing during the life of that contract as well. There's a lot of com companies that are going to bristle at that, but you know what? If we all make it a requirement, then they're going to wake up and smell the coffee. And then further, make sure that your security teams have access to the logs. You need to know who's trying to access your information. I consulted with a company, a financial services company, that had uh, some pretty serious intellectual property. They went to a major cloud provider. They did the boilerplate contract. And I asked them, how many folks have tried getting into your, your system to get your secret sauce? And they said, well, I don't know. You know, the, our provider takes care of that for us. Hello, McFly. If you don't take care of your own stuff, the company that you're dealing with does not maintain the responsibility. You can, you can uh, delegate a lot of things, but you can't delegate the responsibility for your information. Fly into the clouds with your wide, eyes wide open. I already talked about doing the right things the right way. You know, this is more than just cyber hygiene. Uh, it's, in fact, following best practices. And I would contend that compliance is not good enough because a lot of regulations and rules, it takes a long time to go through them. Compliance is important, but I'd rather focus on best practices because best practices will bring you compliance, but compliance doesn't always get you to best practices. Pay attention to doing the right things the right way and at the right time. If you take a look at the, Ver the latest Verizon report, 85% of the breaches were caused by not patching 10, 10 CVEs. Most of them dated back to like 2001. Is that doing due care and due diligence? I don't think so. You also need to be aware of your attack surface. You know, in the federal government, the current architecture is like a domino ready to knock over. It's one of the things that I try getting fixed, but that's going to be a long-term project. Um, you really do need to take a good look at your architecture. The 1980s organization chart architecture does not work anymore. You need to be very, very uh, attuned to your architecture and your attack surface. And you need to think like a hacker when you're building out your new capabilities. Every capability you and your business put out, if you're a CISO, you need to think like a hacker. How could this be defeated by an adversary? And who are those adversaries? And as part of that business case, you need to make sure that you're baking it in or you've got a formal acceptance of risk as part of your business case. And you also need to be a demanding customer. I don't, I'm getting a little fatigued. I don't know about you guys. 
of having to accept products that are coming and being delivered that I'm going to have to patch every single month. You know, wouldn't it be better if we built quality in from the beginning? Let's all be demanding customers, but recognize the, the uh, facts of the marketplace. And then you need to anticipate and innovate. For some folks, I don't know if you can see this. Um, this is a, it's making its way around the internet. Here's a drone with a fishing hook on the end of it. Uh, so this is the next generation of what we're going to see with the drones. You know, we're, we're going to see them do fishing expeditions against us, I guess, is what some folks are saying. What's the next thing? How are you going to protect your information? Are you agile? Are you able to identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover? So a couple of uh, parting thoughts. Uh, first of all, uh, don't panic. It's on the Hitchhiker's Guide. It's on the cover of the Hitchhiker's Guide. Don't panic. A lot of companies are out there going, oh my gosh, you know, the sky is falling. No, we're still being able to maintain the, the greatest economy in the world right now. But our competitive edge here in the United States is eroding. We can do better, and we have to do better. Cyber risk management needs to be part of an enterprise risk management construct. And nothing is risk-free. At some point, you're going to have to accept risk. And most folks don't recognize who the real risk owners are. Uh, make sure that you understand how risk is managed in your company. And ultimately, your directors and your officers of the company are the ones who are the ones that manage and own that risk. But every, every one of us owns a stake in it. Also, recognize there's no perfect model for risk management. I'm one of those guys who does not believe that the government should dictate your risk posture. I think that's, that's wrong. That's uh, against the spirit of innovation here in the United States. But don't necessarily try to reinvent the wheel. Go out there and be part of that information sharing. Um, you get bonus points for, for copy and best practices. So do so. And make sure that you are continuously benchmarking against others. You know, I, I belong to a group of uh, CISOs who continually are calling each other saying, hey, you know, I'm running into this issue. How are you guys dealing with this? You know, participate in those conversations. And keep your leadership informed. If you're one part of the tech team and if you see something, say something. It's critically important to keep leadership informed up the chain, but go across and go down as well. And don't be afraid to ask for help. Tim the Toolman Taylor, I blame him for a lot of problems in society today because Tim the Toolman Taylor didn't read the instruction book. We all need to be reading the instruction book, and we also need to be able to be uh, strong enough to ask for help when we need it. Tim didn't ask for help. Al Borland had to go in and help him out every time. And then finally, the enemy is dynamic. You shouldn't be static. You should be dynamic as well. Adapt, improvise, and overcome. And with that, we've got some time for a few questions. Does anybody have any questions for me? Yes, ma'am. And there's a microphone right behind you if you want to yell into that. Hi. Good um, morning. I'm definitely a younger one in the room, but um, so I work at Eli Lilly and Company, and I'm kind of I'm on the risk assessments team. And you were talking about third-party vendors and how that's becoming very important to kind of know your vendor and know what risks they're facing. So. As we're going through and assessing these vendors, what are kind of the top three areas you would say to look for um, to make sure they're really sound in their security? Thanks for that. And the question was, is in taking a look at third-party vendors, what would be the top three things that I would look for? Uh, first of all, um, do they in fact have a, a uh, solid cybersecurity strategy that aligns with my own and, and the best practices out there? And I think taking a look at the cybersecurity uh, framework is part of that uh, look. So I would uh, assess their strategy and uh, their governance of that strategy uh, through the lens of the cybersecurity framework. That's number one. Two is I would ask um, uh, to pen test against them. Um, I'm finding that there are some folks that say, ooh, I don't want to be pen tested. 
And I've had conversations with folks as to why. And the ones that are pretty confident in their abilities will say, yeah, go ahead. Um, and, and sometimes even if they say no, because it could reveal information from other uh, clients that they have, it opens the conversation with them. And you get a better sense as to their, uh, their abilities. And then uh, three is I would ask who their third party vendors are and how do they assess third part, their own uh, third party. Because they may be a third party to you, but who are their third parties? Uh, multiple back doors and tracing all, all of that becomes critically important. So those are the three that I would go with. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Chris Clifton from here at Sirius. And uh, you've made several statements involving training and additional users. Everybody needs to know the risks. Uh, one of the problems, though, is all of these people who need to know these things have other jobs to do as well. And they don't ask you to know their job. Uh, how do we deal with this fact that many of the people that need to know things have too many other things they already need to know? Well, you know, frankly, and thank you for that question. I never asked anybody to do my job. Um, but I, as an executive, risk is part of every executive's job. Doesn't matter if they're a lawyer, if they're an operations manager, what, you know, risk is part of running any business. And it doesn't matter if it's a public sector business or a private sector business. Putting terms, uh, putting risk in terms that people understand is critically important. I'm not asking folks to understand the technical wizardry that me and my team were doing, but rather the impact and as well as the risk exposure. So I would, uh, I would discuss risk in terms that they would understand and put it in basically the operational uh, cases. When I was in the military, um, I, I made the case for um, uh, blocking some, uh, some activities, you know, some Facebook and some social media things from some of our operational elements. And a lot of folks came in. I, I had a four-star commander came in and said, my last command, we had access to Facebook and you know LinkedIn and all of that. Um, so what I did was, I, I, first of all, I got with my director of intelligence, who was picking up information from bits and pieces. Our air crews were going around the world delivering stuff to our troops. We were able to make the business case from a risk perspective that would show that um, our adversaries were harvesting information from social media and were able to predict when that next great tail with the US flag on it was going to land at such and such a location where that ship was going to show up. We were able to demonstrate how that was uh, adding risk exposure. So we invested to train our crews not to put information out on Facebook and the like and then further, um, our chief of staff said, you know what? You don't need Facebook to do your job at work. Um, we're we're going to cut that down because, frankly, it was adding drag to our organization. And our, our J8, our budget guy, he said, oh, yeah, because we were able to show the data that showed how much folks were spending on ESPN and, uh, you know, some of the other stuff. It was, we put it in business terms. We didn't put it in technical terms. And we shaped the behavior, we shaped investments, and we helped the commander make informed decisions based on his priorities. Thank you. Proud of Boil, proud Boilermaker. Um, Is that what you have in the cup? Not, <laughs> not anymore. <laughs> um, so, you were talking about enterprise risk management. Yeah. Um, how does your philosophy change as um, you start to talk to smaller and smaller companies? You know, I'm I'm a I'm a small manufacturing firm, uh, 100 people, 100 employees total. You may have an IT manager who's a repurposed network engineer. How does the conversation change? The, well, I think the strategic aspects remain pretty much the same, Todd, and I think it scales well. You know. Do you need to harden your workforce to, against the threats that are out there? Do you, do you want everybody to 
pretty well know some of the rules you know, that they should follow? Are you, you keeping them aware of you know, how important it is to protect information? I'd say, yeah. You know, it doesn't matter if you're a, a single person proprietorship or a large multinational conglomeration. Two, you need to be sensitive to the value of your information. Do you need your secret sauce protected, you know, your intellectual property? You know, do you need to maintain your competitive advantage in the workplace and the market? Yeah, I think so. How about doing the right things the right way? You know, if, when it comes to the technology, but you know, just the handling of information. You know, how many folks leave stuff out on their desks and then you know, the janitorial crew comes in and can come and hoover stuff up? Um, you know, it, it doesn't matter the size, I think. It's understanding the, how to do the right things the right way uh, that becomes a training issue, which is very personal, too. And that's really a frontline supervision responsibility. And I think that scales up and, and all the way down. Uh, continuously innovating and investing wisely, I think that goes with everybody, too. You know, my wife just graduated from a flip phone to uh, um, an iPhone that I got her. And, oh, my gosh, you know, the vistas that that has opened up. Uh, <laughs> She gets it now because she sees what the rewards are for continuously innovating and investing wisely. Um, but you know what? I've also got, as my wife calls it, the Starfleet um, uh, bridge down in our basement where I've got my collection of computers. Um, and, and I am downsizing now. I'm starting to retire them, you know, <laughs> begrudgingly too. Um, <laughs> But I recognize that as things became increasingly difficult to defend, I just unplugged some of them. And you know, there's some games that I like to play that aren't, they won't run on my new systems. But you know what? As, as my needs grew and capabilities uh, came out, you know, I went out and I got some new stuff too. And I think continuously innovating and investing wisely, that scales up as well from the smallest to to the biggest. And a great example on that too is uh, web presence. Small business now, you can open a, a storefront with you know, just web presence. And uh, you, know, you, you, know, you can go through Etsy and do things here, you know, at home. And then the last thing is just making informed cyber risk decisions at the right level. I think that scales extremely well as, uh, too. You know, you've got to make sure that everybody understands the risk, but the risk is being the decisions are being made at the right level. And uh, OPM was a great example where the folks in the server room knew that it was a disaster waiting to happen. And I'm not convinced that it was fully communicated as well up the chain of command. And uh, you know, one of the first things I did as Deputy Assistant Secretary is we brought in Kathy Archuleta and Donna Seymour, the Director of OPM and uh, her brand new CIO. And we said, you're owned. We, we had the U.S. CERT in there with the NSA, and we, we did an evaluation. We found the bad guys. We said, you're owned, big time. Kathy understood that things were not good. She didn't understand how bad they were. I don't want to see another Kathy Archuleta take one for the team. I think it's critically important that we communicate risk. We have risk conversations on a regular basis, and those conversations go up, across, and down. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Todd. Is this the hook, Joel? This is the hook. All right, great. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you.